And I wanted to thank you too for, you know, over the years I wasn't aware of how many of my friends, you know, people I know from f festival life and so forth, were getting work from In the Life. Yes. It's so heartwarming yeah. to see so many familiar names you don't know, roll really. That's true. We always worked with uh, people in the community. I mean, Johnny Simons is on there. I mean, everybody who was like doing film or video, we always would give them a call because we wanted all these different perspectives and diversity mm -hmm. um, to constantly be the hallmark of the show. I, wow. I came on to In the Life in uh, 2007, and it was a very different show. It was more when you saw the rap piece. That was uh, the year that I came on. And it was more, uh, it had gone from a variety show um, when we saw the pilot. That was its inception as a wonderful new v variety show um, to a news magazine. Um, and it was called like a gay 60 minutes. And there were a lot of hosts and correspondents that you saw. And um, I wanted to take it more into, I wanted to get rid of the hosts and take it more into a gay front line kind of uh, direction and be investigative and kind of attack the right and call them out on their shit. <laughs> they and it. I wanted to go back to the variety show. I just love variety. It was so much fun in the variety show, I know. It was so great. I love that the first moments are kind of like gay church in a little bit. There's the choir and everybody's like hosanna and It's a different kind I of church. I love the audience and people clapping. And oh, that was Our audience coordinator for our first three shows, Dan Kagan, right there. Wow. Stand up, Dan. Bravo. That was terrific. I mean, that was the big job. And, you know, the biggest job for In the Life at the beginning was the, uh, the well, as, as Kate would say, the, uh, the Purple Room. Can you imagine a show, the first show, we had 170 gay men chorus. We had the Lavender Light. We had, I mean, the, to feed them all. I mean, that's all we worked on was the Purple Room. Uh, well, we called it the Purple Room. That's what was our job. We forgot. I walked into the... Uh, you know, the control room where we had three cameras. And I said, okay, let's go. And then they look, and then I forgot, we forgot a director. We didn't even bring a director inside the camera. We were so busy making sandwiches. And they look at me, and I say, okay, I'll direct. And so off we went. And we just, I said, pick one, two. Oh, that's a good shot. Oh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And that was our first show. I can't believe we forgot the director, but that's how we began. Well, that was already a great distance to have come. I mean, I was trying to think... Um, 1992, you're probably conceiving things, or it's, it's really heating up 1991 or something like that. Yeah, it was 1991. Yeah. So there have been very important action, Queer Nation, ACT UP, you know, the, people knew about these things and so forth, but the, that doesn't seem like the kind of wave that gets a gay and lesbian television show on public television nationwide. How'd you do it? <laughs> yes, it was, uh, oh well, thank goodness for Bob Dole and those people too, they helped. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> the, the whole thing about being attacked at the beginning before we even began was sort of important for us in some ways because it gave us a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we had a, we did the sort of, uh, one of the things about In the Life at the beginning it was very exciting was that it was a people grassroots show. We had something like 20,000 to 25,000 supporters and uh, financial support, you know, people who became members like, public television. It was very important because we started with six stations and because of that that grassroots thing, there were all these people saying, well, you know, I paid for the show, I want it on my local television and that was, I mean, we went very quick. Uh, you know, uh, Catherine Lynn, one of her jobs most of the time was calling up program directors and getting them to put it on putting it on and she would just say you know it's offered you can take it and then a week later they'd get like 300 postcards from people saying where is my show and it really it was in a rather interesting way I mean it really was grassroots support from hundreds of people all over the country who really made that show happen it yeah. demonstrates a real faith on your part that the community is there and can be mobilized. In this well, moment. you just had to be around in 1991 and see what was going on in 1990 after the AIDS crisis and ACT UP and all that. People were just really, uh, they were, you know, people weren't going to say no. They really wanted, wanted everything. <laughs> yeah, that kind of support really helped us with programmers because even when I came on, uh, we still weren't carried like in places like Tennessee, 
some towns in Ohio, you know, there were regions that just flat out didn't program in the life for during the whole month. I mean, it was really the um, choice of the programmer when they wanted to slot our show. So no one never, we, no one ever really knew when to watch the show. It was a whole different, you know, you had to be channel surfing maybe to get it or look in your lo local newspaper, or check their, you know, listings. Anyway, um, that kind of support really uh, helped galvanize uh, the show to stay on stations and public television. I would hear it all the time from programmers, even in 2007, to, that those letters of support helped keep our show on air, even against the letters of support that, or letters dismissing the show or, you know, calling to ban it. So thank you. It was a real, a real grassroots effort all across the country. And in yeah. the life even had a membership um, as well. Yeah. People would send $5, it was great. Grassroots. And very stylish and just, you know, and a lot of great talents um, that you were able to bring together in this, in this cause. I, I, you know what? I once had the good luck of eating at Floron, and so the thought of all this taking place <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> over all that is just it's too much. Yeah, uh, well, you know, we, we did have a lot of freedom, believe it or not. You know that uh, Stonewall 25 show that, we, that you saw? Um, that show, just to give you an idea how much freedom we had, can you imagine doing a show uh, for public television that's going to go over at least 100 stations around the country, and we didn't have enough time to finish it? So we literally took the finished film on, on that day, Stonewall 25, and ran down to the satellite in Channel 13 and pushed it into the thing that, well, the engineer, the union guy pushed it in, pushed the button, and that was... No one had, I hadn't even seen it. None of us had seen it. We just put it on. And that's how close we were. I mean, uh, I never want to live that again. But, but uh, so we had a lot of flexible, people were kind of afraid of us because of this membership mm -hmm. thing, uh, this, uh, you know, public television said, okay. You know, in a lot of cases, we had a lot of flexibility. No other show, uh, you have to have it done three months ahead of time to get a show on public television. Uh, uh, unless it's a live show that's, you know, something like the news or something like that. But we, we had a lot of acts, uh, freedom to uh, do a lot of stuff that I think you might get in trouble with. Now, I was seeing some stuff, the earlier stuff was pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you could do it now. It's some of the things that we were doing then. It was, uh, there, it, it's, it's a change in media, you know. But the program itself, you know, um, um, sliced through um, queer. I mean, it, it was such an interesting time there in the in the early '90s because you're still, for heaven's sake, you know, the first several episodes still in the Bush years, and and um, yeah, um, it's amazing. And there was all that important work, you know, ongoing work around uh, HIV/AIDS policy and everything. But um, uh, even so, that you were later, you were in the Bush years again after a certain amount of time, and there was a lot of important work left to be done. It had covered a lot of times, yeah. Yeah, we always felt like we were on the front lines of something, you know, some political battle, and that's why I made that 20 years of the culture war, yeah. and I came to interview you. Yes. It was wonderful to get your perspective, but also to get the perspective of living through the AIDS crisis and that level. Yeah. Um, and that devastation. I mean, there's a shot in there, I don't know if you saw it, but people, you know, were throwing ashes on the White House lawn. I mean, and In the Life was there, covering it. Right. I mean, that's, that's powerful. That's, it, it, the archive is, it's a critical legacy, and I, I'm so happy that it's here at UCLA, getting, getting the, what it deserves, the look that it deserves. Um, I'm just thrilled, really. Yeah. In, in fact, I, if we asked, you know, how, how, how many such images only exist in this setting, I wonder if it would be, you know, uh, a very, very high uh, proportion of, uh, you know, particularly those things on, well, actions like that that you just mentioned in the White House, and then all the international work that was done, because then they went yeah, to we Latin actually, America. And right. We did, a, we did a show in Cuba in, like, one of our first years, you know, um, Gays in Cuba. So there was a tremendous amount of uh, international, mm. uh, while well, the focus got much greater internationally later, 
But even from the beginning, there was this sense that we were going to be international. And, and uh, I, you know, I love that feeling of the first episode that those, those drapes, are those like the kind of drapes I saw in a kindergarten play last week? Or, you know, those <laughs> like things, like every kind of way to make the show come off are probably on a budget and so forth. And then oh when I think God. of you having correspondence yes. internationally and so forth, is this all on the basis of having a subscriber basis? Or? Well, no. I mean, there were foundations that had to give money, too. I mean, we did have a lot of members at the beginning. And, and, and don't forget, In the Life wasn't even a, a non -pro It wasn't anything for the first five years. Right. It was just, uh, you know, fiscal sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And so whatever way we could get money, and whatever way we could stretch a dollar, I mean, the correspondents used to go and to Macy's or whatever, buy us, you know, an outfit and hide the, um, <laughs> the, tags. the tags, you know, <laughs> and then they'd look nice and spiff on TV, and then they'd bring it back the next day saying it, <laughs> it didn't fit. You know, if, if you only knew, <laughs> hopefully the sales clerks weren't watching the show. Uh, <laughs> that looks like what I saw last week. <laughs> so we did all kinds of things to save money. There were a lot of volunteers, a lot of people who worked. Um, staff was paid very little money. Uh, and uh, so it really, you know, really, really stretched the dollar, as they say, and uh, I'll never forget the first time. You know, and there were so many people in the closet in those days. Uh, so uh, it was hard to get people who were, uh, you know, well suited to produce television. Mm -hmm. uh, a good friend of mine used to uh, produce the NBC Evening News, was a producer on the NBC Evening News. And after about five years of In the Life, he finally came over and he said, uh, John, you know, I think I'd like to do a show. The show's looking really good. I think I'd like to do a show. And I said, Joe, uh, we'd love to have you. Come on over tell him, pitch me your idea. So he came over and he pitched this idea. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. You know, produce that. Go ahead. And then he said, well, what's my budget? And I told him what the budget was. And he said, John, <laughs> our messenger budget at NBC <laughs> is bigger than that. One day, I couldn't do that. I couldn't produce that. And that's when I discovered, I realized then, we not only learned how to produce our own shows, but we learned it in a way that was very inexpensive that really was a talent of the people who were involved to be able to do them I mean, really... Uh, these producers from NBC couldn't do it. They yeah. just wouldn't know how to do it. It was a, it was an experience for me to realize that not only were we creating television, but we were creating it in a way that uh, was different in terms of cost. Yeah, it and was really, radical. It so was radical. it was radical in that way too of how to produce, on uh, how to produce a nine-minute piece on a thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, and, but you did get these wonderful producers that wanted to do something that was meaningful. I mean, that's how I came to In the Life myself. I was doing, prior to In the Life, I was doing freelance production, and I wanted to, I wanted work that was meaningful. And, yeah. you know, so we would mm -hmm. constantly call people, you know, who were um, either big names in the LGBT community or people that were just, you know, well, you know, good producers and tell them this is, you know, pitch us your stories or, you know, we want to green light this, could you do it? And they were just happy and honored yeah. to be a part of the In the Life. Right. Planet. Well, that's what happened later on as time went about more and more. I mean, coming out was a big thing. And a lot of people started being able to work in the regular media and come out and and but they did find while they could come out they still had many limitations they that they wouldn't have had by coming over and working with Jack so that was a really important important part for them to do and also w with that work um, it was a great responsibility I mean because here you were you know you had a half hour or an hour on public television and with that you know great responsibility also came you know like just this feeling of um, you know freedom as right. you say um, but also um, a privilege it was it was an incredible I can tell you I was there for five years of my life and it was an incredible privilege to be a part of and you know I thank I thank the heavens that I you know got to live it yeah you know? I, I was sad experience. that I had to do the final episode though yeah, that's pretty painful <laughs> but we got Kate so yeah. <laughs> we kept it in the family did you want to Open yeah, I wonder, I've got plenty more questions, but why don't we share the, the time a little bit. There are um, some microphones in the house, and if you have a question, we'll show us a hand. 
we'll rush a microphone to you. And so, oh, I see one right here in the middle. Oh, look at this. So thank you both for, for being part of this program and for all your work. Um, I had a question about uh, representations of transgender communities. I feel like, you know, it was touched upon briefly in, you know, the, this piece, but, uh, but I wanted to hear what your thoughts were in terms of, you know, the many years that the program took place and how uh, the program addressed uh, that particular community. So if you would mind. When we started LGBT, the T was not very, I mean, one of the things about In the Life and one of the things about the LGBT movement is that in itself has grown, you know. And so um, while this piece, that was probably one of the smaller elements that's a little bit missing, I think uh, In the Life really began to take seriously the T in LGBT uh, uh, in its uh, later days and there were many many I mean I, I remember seeing some great stories that were done uh, about transgender people and so I don't think this piece really reflected some of that maybe there, there's an early one there's a really great early one um, of a transgender um, fire fire uh, woman <laughs> she's a trans woman who's in who's a um, in a local I mean that was the great thing about in the life is that it would go into a rural place in America and do a story on a trans person who you know works in a fire department so there are some beautiful gems like that um, and it would be kind of a profile piece you know kind of like you know that another part of that privilege was being able to like not only come in to share someone's life and their experience but also like sit in their living room and film them you know making a cup of tea you know but it, it's true John's right um, it did get more um, critical for us to show stories and we did um, when the injustice at every turn study came out we did a piece immediately that addressed that study but along the way I would say there were some nice profile pieces um, and maybe some political um, gender, certainly things on gender um, and larger topics. Uh, but you would get a story here and there. Um. As I recall, I mean, one of the things, you know, love to have done a three-hour show too, but, but, a, mm -hmm. but a wonderful piece about, ch about um, very young children yeah. who were... Um, oh, yeah, becoming me. ...differently gender identifying, oh, God, you know, all across the board. Yeah. God, that, yes, there's, a, there's an incredible half hour, the entire show, I dedicated the whole show to it. I mean, it started out as a segment that was going to be like maybe 10 minutes, and I was like, this needs to be the entire show, and it's called Becoming Me, and it's about gender non-conforming youth. And it, it was one of the highest uh, YouTube uh, views that we had ever gotten. Uh, it was used by PFLAG. It was just people were just clamoring it's for very more content. Show, yeah. um, so that's something so that I worked on. I, that, but that was later. I mean, too. of all shows, probably in you know, Life was one of the few shows that really did reflect itself in terms of being able to listen and be out there because the people involved were so out there that they would run into these kinds of issues constantly. So the, it, the, the ability to get feedback into the program was very, was very easy. In other words, we actually, you know, through membership, through whatever, we really felt the desire to reflect the audience that we were creating a film about. And so therefore, I think as time went through on In the Life Transgendered People, as they became more and more presenting their voice, there was a place in which it could be heard. And In the Life certainly was that. Well, let me just say one more thing on that. Um, I had the privilege of producing and directing a conversation with Janet Mock and Isis King. Um, that we had done, and this was, of course, in the later years. Um, and we, you know, we wanted to tackle the fact that people only talk about Trans 101. So we wanted the conversation to be ele elevated at the beginning. And, you know, so there was always that expectation of in the life 
not only meeting with the community, but challenging the community to go farther. Um, and it just so happened in that conversation, we mentioned Laverne Cox and um, showed a picture of her. And it ended up being that I was like, let's call Laverne Cox in and have her you know, pitch a story to us. And what Laverne ended up pitching is now a film that I'm directing, the Free CC documentary with Laverne. We decided to make that after In the Life ended. So In the Life was, it was one of those magical points of light <laughs> kind of places that even if we saw something that was underrepresented or um, needed to be addressed more, we were always open and examining ourselves and doing it. You know, it was just, that's how we worked. Another question in the audience? Uh, very top. I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about the feedback you got from the right. We saw a little bit of that on video. And then also the feedback you got from kids in the Midwest who this was uh, the only way that they learned about what um, a world that they were, that was close to them otherwise. Well, I'll start with the kids in the Midwest a little bit because, uh, and then you can, because um, you can talk a little bit about the right. Uh, we immediately started getting letters uh, from people when we first started doing in the life, and it really affected our approach to the whole nation. And so, for example, um, I always love to tell a story, you know, because once we started producing programs and opening it up for producers to come in and pitch programs. We used to get a lot of great pitches from people. And I'll never forget, I had just received a letter like two days before where the 16-year-old kid was going on about this is the first time that he was able to sit with his family and in the living room of his house and watch people like himself on TV with his mother and father, and he was just wanted to thank us, and it was just overwhelming for him. He was 16. And I'll never forget, uh, that same day, a little bit later, somebody came in to pitch, uh, um, you know, there was all this access television that was taking place in those days, especially in New York City. And we didn't want people to think that we were a New York-centric show, so we purposely really went out to places all over America, even though we couldn't afford it, but we tried to do it, you know, go to Montana for the first gay pride march, you know, just get a sense of being out in the country. We thought that was very, very important. And not identify where we were from, so we purposely didn't say, oh, in the life from New York. But we slowly but surely uh, try to make it a national program. And uh, I'll never forget, the, this uh, woman came in, she wanted to produce a show, and she said, oh, you know, there's this thing going on on the Lower East Side uh, uh, where women are, it's so cool, women are, what is it, clit rings. Do you know what, I don't even know what they are. But it was like clit rings, and she really wanted to do a piece on this. And I thought, to be honest with you, I thought the whole thing about piercing and all that was an important thing to do some work on and I wasn't sure how to approach it, but I did think it was important. But I just then read her this letter from this 16 year old kid and she said, you know, you're right. And, you know, and then she left. And before I got a chance to kind of really think about piercing and what it could be and how we could make a film about piercing or make a piece about piercing. So the Midwest was very important for us and the ability to be able to be in homes in South Dakota and places in Wisconsin and, and that was very important and we took it very seriously. And, um, and so, you know, we knew that that was an important mission for us, was to make a program that felt comfortable for uh, people to watch, but not to talk down to people. We tried not, as you can see, maybe a little too much with hege hegemonic. Hegemonic. <laughs> well, um, we tried not to talk down, but, yeah. you know, it was difficult. You can um, talk about the right wing. Well, I, first I want to say the the other thing, there's a producer, Dan Karslake, who's a wonderful filmmaker, yeah. um, that we interviewed um, after one of his films for The Bible Tells Me So, um, had like stellar reviews and great 
success. And Dan talked about how when he was a producer at In the Life, he got a letter from a kid uh, in the Midwest who had just come across channel surfing, found just by chance found In the Life, and had written a letter that he had bought a gun and was planning on shooting himself until he saw this show and he realized he wasn't alone and he you know threw the gun in the river and no one ever had to know but he had to tell in the life that we had changed the course of his life so i mean that's the kind of stuff that people would say to you if you walked up and yeah. <laughs> with a camera in in iowa you know to go interview them about their gay marriage i mean i got to feel that and experience that and like i said it will stay with me all my life. But um, on the front of the, um, you know, the religious right, there were times that Catherine Linton would go or certain producers would go undercover at these like kind of peacekeepers, you know, um, demonstrations, you know, and kind of, you know, we were always trying to like, you know, get in and get some footage, you know, and then get out <laughs> and not, you know, start anything with anybody because it was very, it was hard to not, you know, engage and be angry in those kinds of situations. So that was one way that we interacted with the religious right. The other way was just to flat out show what they were saying about us and expose them. And the other thing that I did was invite them to come on our program and talk to us. <laughs> so we had Brian Brown from NOM <laughs> talking to us about yeah. the New York um, <laughs> passing same-sex marriage. And, uh, you know, we had, we invited Mal Maggie Gallagher and she was like, I'm not going to speak to you because you'll edit my footage. <laughs> And we were like, yes, we will edit you. Um, so, you know, it was, that was what we tried to do. We tried to engage with them ultimately. And, you know, maybe they would come and talk to us. And most likely they did, they wouldn't. They would just say no to us. Um, what's actually, along those lines, what's maybe the most astounding person you think you ever captured? Uh, Sir Dina Walker, for me, I did a piece um, uh, called Bully Sides, and I mean, it was an intense um, look at uh, kids who were not even, you know, maybe they didn't identify, I mean, these are children, but uh, kids who were perceived as being gay um, by their peers and um, within a school system that didn't really do anything to protect them, and um, Sir Dina Walker was a mother of a uh, Carl Joseph Walker Hoover, who was an 11-year-old boy who hung himself. Um, so her interview uh, was certainly one of the more um, intense and, you know, moments of my life, for sure. And then there was Liza Minnelli, too. <laughs> yeah, Liza <laughs> With Charles great. Bush, there's a great conversation that we did that, I mean, the two of them together. I think uh, Liza was proposing to Charles at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> she was trying to get him to marry her. <laughs> you know, it's all a blur to me. Um, the, the, you know, uh, the, I, I have been blessed to have interviewed more than maybe 2,000 LGBT people. <laughs> in the world <laughs> and um, you know from my documentaries and the life what, whatever I was doing I you know I just was meeting so many wonderful people I did a wonderful film uh, called Dangerous Living uh, and, and did a lot of people around the world mm -hmm. and I, I it's sort of a, 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 I shouldn't use the word blur it all kind of comes into this being in itself of so many wonderful amazing people who've been through hell and back and are still, re, you know, resilient and willing to fight. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. And uh, that, to me, you know, it's a, the totality of, the, of the, the diversity of all those people seems to come out as something. I don't know what it is. But there's no real individual. It's just so many amazing people. Mm -hmm. who, I mean, I, I've always said, and it w you know, since what was going on in the LGBT community, or we used to call it the gay and lesbian community when I was younger, uh, is so exciting and so interesting and uh, full of just amazing people, whether, you know, people like Larry Kramer to, you know, the, the, the kid who is, you know, in a 
queer center in Minneapolis or wherever. It's just amazing people all sort of added up. And that to me has been a real blessing in my life to have met and seen so many of these people and be able to record them. And uh, it's so exciting that there's some place to save it. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. All that material. I, I'm so pleased that that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we're grateful, too. I, I wanted to check and see if there's any. If there's one more question. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask about the decision to end the show and how that came about. Talked to the wrong guy up here for that, but you go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to give that to me. <laughs> volley that to me. <laughs> I'll let you volley. Well, um, it, it really was the decision of um, the board, which was the nonprofit producing organization at a, at a board. Um, and the board had decided that they, we had achieved our mission, you know, that there was the original intent was, you know, for visibility. I mean, we started with a variety show that, you know, the joke is, you know, not another gay television show, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, you know, 20 years later, um, we are being able to um, hear about, read about um, gay marriage and same-sex marriage in the mainstream uh, media, you know. So the board had decided that it, a mission achieved. You know, you did such a great job that now you're out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and that was, you know, that was wonderful to hear, you know, they really congratulated us. But, you know, there were many people, of course, myself included, that felt that there was a lot of work, a lot of spe specifically trans, in the trans community, a lot of representation that we could have kept on going, <laughs> at HIV stories, you know, so we were um, very, you know, we felt like there was still a lot to do, but we always felt that way because we took our work incredibly seriously. I think I said it was, there was a, a lot of responsibility. We really felt like we were changing the, the world every month with every broadcast. <laughs> you know, hey, look at this, <laughs> change your mind. <laughs> well, I want to keep on a positive note, so I, uh, I won't comment too much about the ending of In the Life, but um, except to say that uh, it was an incredible network, and that network existed until the last day that In the Life was shown. So uh, it's, it's an amazing thing to have lost uh, uh, one of the few networks in the country. Um, and so there, there, there is a big loss there. There's a lot more to be done, a lot, a lot of great programs that could be done. And um, so, I felt, um, so I felt a little sad by, by the loss of this. I mean, can you imagine if I told you, oh, we have 200 stations you can be on tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, with a, a program. Um, you jump at that. And uh, that's what was lost, was uh, the ability to reach all over America uh, with a TV show and, uh, and, and broadcast. And, um, and so there are a lot of people were seeing it, even though maybe not so much in L.A. or or New York, but it still was a very important program in Virginia and in places all over the country that, you know, many of us have never heard of. Um, so uh, I was saddened to see it go, and I still think it could have continued, <coughs> but things happen. And John, it is not gone. Because What's that? It's not gone. <laughs> and it's not gone. It still lives <laughs> on. Uh, uh, as, as director of the archive, you know, yes. I, I feel so privileged that, you know, we will now take care of this legacy. And, and uh, uh, it's not, it will not disappear into the archive. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sooner or later, all of it, and I mean really all of it, will be online for anyone to look at. And I think that... When just watching the show tonight, and Shannon, congratulations on a, a great really? cut. Yeah. Uh, the intense humanity of it is, is just so gripping that I think uh, going online, hopefully, you know, more and more people will see that it will have a very long afterlife. 
Yeah, I felt a real stewardship um, from the legacy, you yes. know, that was created by this man, this wonderful man here, <laughs> you know, to, to keep that up, you know, to keep that um, going. And now I feel that UCLA has taken up the stewardship um, Definitely. So, I mean, it's true. It was it was really difficult for us to get carriage, what's called carriage, you know, to get to be seen on public television at a regular time, on a regular day, you know. That was always the battle. And it was something that we achieved our mission without having a regular day and time that you could tune in <laughs> to watch the show. So that in itself is kind of amazing, given the fact the way we watch TV on demand now, and maybe so many people, I, I can't even tell you, everybody would say, I just happened to find the show one night, you know, and now I'm looking for it, you know. So, I mean, it was, it, it really was a, it was an anomaly, <laughs> you know, it really was something yeah. special. And I'm glad it's in your hands now, for sure. It's going to be very exciting, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you all and, and making sure that um, that there is this life for In the Life. It really is an amazing, amazing amount of material. And I, I really like your your statement about humanity. It really, I mean, I really that came across very much so to me watching this, Shannon. It was really amazing uh, feeling of of that of of just. What an amazing group of people, you know, that 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 we were able to record and and save. Uh, pretty amazing. Well, thank you both for being with us and helping us to celebrate the the legacy and um, give it a great bounce going forward into the future. So we'll I guess we'll meet each other online. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in further and episodes of In the Life. Thank you all thank very you much. Thank you for having me. And, and <laughs> some of my In the Life supporters, thank you for being here.